In the second episode of Devonison Month, the title for this episode is Rules. We don't need no stinking rules. Gary and Dave shared credit on the white bus. But as things advanced, their relationship was on the rocks. Less people know his name, but he revolutionized war games with the first fantasy campaign. On a song. And a big thank you to TJ Drennan for the opening theme. TJ who I'm playing with in the Barrow Maze campaign with run by Cody Mazza. TJ has a Patreon at patreon.com slash TJD. And if you become a subscriber to him, he will write you tunes for your podcast. So please check out TJ's Patreon. Hey, Pete, Jason here. That was a great episode. I had pre-recorded my episode and gone in a different direction. Now I'm tempted to <laughs> re-record over and go with a, a more positive spin. But I think instead I'll, I'll leave a message with you. This might take more than a minute, just a warning. So I talked about in one of my episodes a game of ICRPG Blacklight that I played in, which is like Delta Green. And all the players in that game were excellent. Well, all the players except me, probably. But the other player. So we had examples of a psychic that, you know, when confronted with a, you know, occult materials, refused to to handle it and and, and open their sensitive side to research it because they didn't want to know. You know, they they played. They were playing their character as hesitant and not wanting to go further into that you know, trip into madness. So they, they didn't look for the clues intentionally, which was, you know, inter- very well, very much true to the character. And I don't know how many people could refuse to, refuse is the wrong word, how many people could resist, you know, looking for that in-game clue. We also had two characters that had gone insane. They had a an evil thing that was calling to both of them, telling them that they had to have it. And they both, you know, failed their sandy rolls. So they role played to the hilt, playing against each other, trying to get it from each other. You know, ending up where they ended up holding each other gunpoint and shooting each other, and then trying to convince all the other characters that the other one was insane and they were sane. And you know, and then when they, because they kept failing their sandy rolls, but it, they just played it to the T and stayed in character, and they didn't break the game. They didn't overdo it. You know, it, it was well done in character and just excellent. So I, I definitely would take my hat off to them. It is doing such a great job. So those are my, my very recent positive character stories. Thanks for the call, Jason. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Players immersing themselves in the fiction. And doesn't it make for a memorable game? See, it's stuck in your mind's eye. And I think times like that, it really does help the game and it makes a memorable game that you can look back on in the future. So thanks for that, Colin Jason. Now, on to the main topic. As I said in the first episode, Dave Arneson was famous in his Blackmore campaign for not having any formulated rules that anyone knew of. So for this episode, I'm going to talk about one of the rules light systems that I like and the reason I like it. And the rule system I am going to talk about is the Wanton Roleplay Game by Atlas Games. Now this was the system they used for the Over the Edge game written by Robert D. Laws and Jonathan Tweet. And it was set in a fictional island and the rules for that um, were later released some sort of I was just going to say 20 years later as an open game license um, as the wanted role playing system or the warp system. What I like about warp is there are no set attributes and no set skills. 
And it's the first role-playing game that I'm aware of that did this. There may have been others, but it's the first one that I'm aware of. As I said in the first episode, Dave Arneson was famous in his Blackmore campaign for not having any formulated rules that anyone knew of. So for this episode, I'm going to talk about one of the rules light systems that I like and the reason I like it. And the rule system I am going to talk about is the Wanton Roleplay Game by Atlas Games. Now this was the system they used for the Over the Edge game written by Robert D. Laws and Jonathan Tweet. And it was set in a fictional island called Anjara uh, in, uh, in an ocean. And the rules for that um, were later released some sort of I'm just going to say 20 years later as an open game license um, as the wanted role playing system or the warp system. What I like about warp is there are no set attributes and no set skills. And it's the first role playing game that I'm aware of that did this. There may have been others, but it's the first one that I'm aware of. And basically, when you create your character, the first thing you do is create a concept of the person you want to play. And this can be used for any system, any period really. So it might be a psycho killer commando. It might be a part-time archaeologist that's also a professor in a college. Each character has four traits. And the central trait is the one that defines who the character is. And that trait is defined freeform, so you can describe it any way you want. What I like about this is it's not putting you in a pigeonhole for playing a specific character. In several rule sets, um, you, can, you pick a class, and then from that class, uh, you can create a character by picking points. Or the other system, traditionally, is you roll a number of attributes randomly, and from that, it points you towards a class. With Warp, you decide off the bat, and you describe that as your central trait. The mechanics in the warp system are you roll two to four d6 and you add the scores up and then you compare those to either a target number or an opposing roll from the GM or to another player. And basically the one who has the highest score or the sum of the dice is the winner. So that is the basic core of the whole system. So creating a character. First of all, you have a concept for the character. Now, in most role-playing games, uh, there are usually two methods to build a character. The first one is that you pick an archetype and then you put points into that archetype to define them. Or well, the second way is that you roll some random attributes and depending on what those attributes are, from that you select a class that will fit in with those attributes to give you the best bang for your buck. What Warp does, it lets you just to create a character any way you want. And it does that by having no attributes and no skills. But what it does have is traits. And traits are freeform words and freeform sentences. And you can see this um, uh, where Fate later on um, probably ran with this and took it in a different direction. But in the Wanton Role Playing System, you have a central trait. And this is essentially the your character's identity. So it, it might be a forlorn detective or a superhero pilot or, or something along that ilk. You also have a number of side traits and you have two of these. And these are more specific description of what your character uh, does. And it's usually um, sort of a, a, a characteristic or skill uh, that they have. And the way this works is that if your trait is good, you get 3d6. An average trait would get 2d6. So you start off with your central trait and your two side traits. And you decide of those which is what they call superior. And for your superior trait, you get four dice to roll. And the other two traits, you get three dice. What you also do with your three traits is you have a descriptor, which doesn't really 
have any mechanical effect, but it gives you something to base your character on. So, for example, if you're good in uh, combat as a side trait and a martial artist, you might have scars or you uh, wear a specific dark uniform or something like that. It's a, a tag that uh, helps identify the trait. You also have, um, besides your standard traits, you can also have a technical or an unusual trait. And these, the unusual trait is if you've got something like magic or um, psionics, something like that. And those are a lot more focused traits than your standard trait. And to reflect that, because they're very focused, a good uh, technical or unusual trait would only have one die in it. And a superior te uh, technical or unusual trait would have two dice in it. Each character also comes with a flaw. And the flaw is, the, uh, is another trait, but this is something that holds your character back. And usually it's related to your central trait or your side trait. It has hit points, and basically you have seven hit points per dice in your trait that relates to your toughness or to your defense. So if you've got a trait of uh, thick hide with three dice in it, you would have 21 hit points. And the minimum hit points you can have is 14, and obviously the maximum is going to be 28. You also start the game with one dice in your experience pool, and that is a bonus dice that you can use once during the session to add to your rolls. And that's all there is to um, character creation, really, is defining the, your central trait, your two side traits, and picking which one is superior, and then picking your floor. So how does the rest of the rules work? Very simply, actually. Um, you roll a number of dice equal to your trait, and you're adding the dice up. You can get a, a bonus dice uh, if you have an advantage, which is something that uh, may help you, and that is awarded by the GM uh, for good role playing or an advantage. Besides bonus dice, you can also get penalty dice for the same roll, and you the best way to use the bonus and penalty dice is have them a different colour. And the way it works is if you are rolling three dice for your central trait and you have a bonus, you add a different coloured dice, you roll the all the dice together, and then you take away the you discard the lowest roll. If you have a penalty dice, you would add that to your pool of three dice, roll them, and then take away the highest dice roll. And bonus and penalty dice uh, cancel each other out. So it's a very simple system. So although you're getting bonus and penalty dice, you're not counting one of the dice. So the pool is still the same as your trait. And then you are either rolling against someone else or you are rolling against the GM and the GM will decide the uh, task at hand and how many dice he's going to roll, or he can use a fixed uh, difficulty number. So the difficulty is uh, the number of dice the GM rolls, and that's between one and six dice, one for easy, six for near impossible. Or you can use a score of, it works as a three and a half um, points rounded up for each of those tasks. So um, an easy task would be a challenge rating a task target number of four and up to 18 for um, a near impo possible one. And the way the combat works is uh, you compare the two rolls and the loser subtracts from the winner score and that is the damage cause in hit points loss to the to the loser. There are there is a slight variation to that in that um, weapons uh, multiply the number of points difference by multiplier to give extra damage. So for example, in an armed combat, yes, you would just cause a difference in the two rolls. But if you're using something like a sword, you would multiply the difference in the two rolls by three. And that is the core of the system, really. Uh, there's a little bit extra here and there. But as you can see, 
it's a very flexible system because the character the players can design any character they want and the dice rolls in the main are going to be between usually between two to four to four dice so yes if you're rolling two dice and you're rolling four dice on average you're going to get a difference of between sort of four to eight but if you get a bad roll it can be a difference of 10 or 15 points and if you've got 14 points damage and you're using a gun that could be a lot of all your hit points gone in one go i don't know why warp really never caught on it as i said it's ogl so it's open for use in anybody for their systems i'm guessing because I think the original Over the Edge came out in about 92, the second edition around 97, and it wasn't until uh, mid-2000s that the OGL came out, and I think a lot of interest had waned in Over the Edge by then. Um, there was a new version of Over the Edge, a third edition that came out on Kickstarter, so I think it was earlier this year, which I, backed, I only backed at PDF level, but sadly they completely changed the rule system away from... Um, the warp system and went with a, a more generic standard rule system. What would I do with the warp system? I think there's a lot you can do with it. Um, it's an easy pickup game. You only need D6, so you can play it on the fly. You don't need any character sheets because it's you get away the next card for writing things down. The only thing um, that you would need is the charts for things like damage and for weapons. But then you could quite easily nerf that and adapt that system anyway. So I, th I think it's a very flexible system. And uh, that is uh, my recommendation as a, a rules light system that's in line with uh, Dave Armstrong. So the next episode will be, the subject will be the plays of thing. And in that episode, I will discuss a game I've recently played. Thanks for listening. You have been listening to the Dragons Are Real podcast. My name is Pete Jones. You can follow me on my website at petejones.neocities.org or over my blog at dragonsarealpodcast.tumblr.com. I'm also very active on the OSR Anchorites on Audio Dungeon Discord. The opening music is from Kevin McLeod called Killers. The closing music, also by Kevin McLeod, is fretless.